Springs, let's all be standing together. Thank you for coming this morning. We're here to lift up our praise and worship to God. We do this for Him and to Him, so we invite you to join us. Good morning, church. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had to have some. He would have had something to boast about. But that's not God's way. For the scriptures tell us, 
Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something that they've earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but as a right relationship with God that comes by faith. If God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to not have a law to break. So, the promise is received by faith. It is a free gift and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. This is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life, and who creates new things out of a nothing. The word of the Lord. When I started coming to Quell Springs back in 2008, um, I started coming and I started seeing a lot of authentic Christians people who were really opening up to what God wanted to do with their lives. And I wanted to be a part of it. It was Mission Sunday. There was a video being played and the video said, missions is not about reaching out to those who are already in the pews, but reaching out to the gates of hell. I knew at that moment, I felt the spirit of God within me say, go to Rwanda. Now I am probably one of the most unlikeliest of people uh, as I didn't even have a passport or had never been out of the U.S. But I thought, okay, God, we're on this adventure together. Um, I'd come out of this super, super hard season and was looking for ways of how I was going to be surrendering my life to God. So I went to Rwanda uh, in 2009 on a short-term trip, returned in 2010, and the team at the time asked me to move out there. So in 2011, I moved out there. So eight years ago, I moved out to Rwanda saying, yes, what does this look like? And I um, started a young women's program, helping women uh, seek their identity in God, who God made them to be, help them find work and start micro businesses. If you're visiting with us this morning, uh, we appreciate very much that you've chosen to be part of our community and part of our worship, um, even if just for today. So thank you all for being here. Um, one announcement this morning, we do have, after service today, our annual corporate meeting, a requirement of our nonprofit organization structure. It will be immediately after service in the corner room that we use as a second adult classroom right over here. So if you're interested to be a part of that, you are absolutely welcome. It's so encouraging to me to hear an update from someone like Jamie. Um, it, we have just come out of Missions Month. We've spent some time considering and thinking about our connections to those who are scattered all over the world. One thing that's very unique about our community here is that we have people like Jamie who have risen out of our pews over time, felt the, the spirit urge them to go and do special kinds of work like she's doing in Rwanda. And most of our missionaries have, have been sent that way. So we are supporting not people who have come to us to request funding, but people who are us, who are now throughout the world. Hence, our theme of connected through Christ. That snapshot of her ghost story um, is just part of 
the, the multitude of those that you can find on our website. So if you're interested to hear more people discuss their stories, how God has led them in their lives, the way that they've felt God work in their lives, you can go to our website, thesprings.cc, under the connection or connected tab, um, there's a, a link to ghost stories. And there are many more of those out there and they're all very encouraging and, and I would encourage you to go take a look at those. An update on Missions Month. So we're one week out. Our goal was $115,000 to sustain the work of our missionaries um, all over the world. That first Mission Sunday, between pledges and donations, we received around $80,000. And since then, people either who didn't get a chance those, those first days or who have decided since to give, we're now approaching $88,000. So we're very thankful for your generous hearts and for the way that you're supporting our missionaries. Now it is important um, that we uh, that we make our uh, commitment to those missionaries. So we are not there yet. However, this is a normal situation for us. Every year, if you compare year over year, this is where we start. And then we end the year by being able to be faithful to our commitments to our missionaries. So I do want to just take this moment to encourage you to, uh, if you have not had an opportunity to give, you can give online, you can drop an envelope in the basket, um, you can, in any of those ways, designate that money for missions. Or if you have not had an opportunity to pledge, you can do that pledge through AutoDraft Online, um, or you still have opportunities to do that as well. So please, if you have not had an opportunity, consider what you might give to support those people. One of the first and core tenets of our vision on the mission team for Missions at the Springs is that everyone is able to participate. So giving is one way to do that, but even more so, we would really like you to pray for our missionaries and the work that they are doing. But one way that you can do that is we have magnets um, still here at the welcome desk. And if you weren't able to get one of those, that's one way to put in front of yourself a reminder uh, whenever you see that to pray for our missionaries, to ask for God's hand on them, to ask that God's love would be spread through the world as a result of their work and of ours. One of the second core tenets of our vision is that God's work is diverse. He works internationally through the folks that we have highlighted to you. But if you've been watching on our website and our ghost stories and those things, you know that that work is not reserved to abroad. Our mission is to reach others with God's love as well. And so there are opportunities here to participate through benevolence ministry, through the relationships you have day to day. Um, so don't feel like you are limited in the ways you can participate just to giving, just to praying for them. Um, but we'd love you to consider um, how you may participate in other ways as well. I want to read our theme verse um, of Ephesians 2, 17 to 22, one more time, um, coming down from Missions Month. And please just listen and consider how this has informed our theme, Connected Through Christ. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord, and in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Please pray with me. God, we can only thank you for having brought us together. This community means a great deal to us, whether through support or the examples that we see or the encouragement we receive of your work being done here. It is beautiful the way that you have brought us together from whatever diversity of our background, the way that you have connected us to folks all over the world who are all worshiping you today on Sunday and who are all considering how they can spread your love to the world around them. God, we pray that you would provide for our missionaries who we've committed to support. And we pray that they would have what they need to continue their work. And God, we pray that you would, as always, be faithful to provide to provide that amount that we need. 
God, it is because we are connected in real time to those all over the world that we're especially concerned today uh, for all of those impacted and, and fearful of the COVID-19 coronavirus. We pray that you would stop the spread, that you would limit the impact. Our desire is that your hand of peace and comfort be on those affected and that your hand of protection would be on those who are not yet affected. Thank you for the way you provide for us. And God, in all things, may your will be done. And thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all be standing and let's raise a hallelujah to God. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a Come to fight for me. 
I've been thinking about crowds a lot lately, both literal crowds of gathered people and figurative crowds that may be connected only electronically. Whether or literal or figurative, crowds can have great power. Crowds can be determined, emotional, dedicated, and often wrong. Crowds can spread contagious disease. Crowds can spread cont contagious ideas. In my lifetime, I've seen protests and riots to make sure those who are shut out are let in. I've also seen protests and riots to make sure those who are shut out are kept out. History for thousands of years is full of such crowds. Crowds can be forces for good, but they're not always dependable guides for what's true and right and eternal. There was a crowd that followed God through the Red Sea to the base of Mount Sinai and onto the Promised Land, but still they got lost all along the way. Jesus' disciples, who were actually following, following God on earth, still got lost and scattered. We can follow God and still get lost along the way. But sometimes those who get lost and scattered have the greatest message to tell the world when they find their way again. And you have some of those stories. As we walk through Lent, I've been thinking about the crowds that followed the light, the only true light we have ever had. Just a few days before Jesus' death, a crowd accompanied him into Jerusalem, laying palm branches at his feet and hoping he would be king. Then his last meal of Passover was shared with only 12, which became 11 before the dinner was through. Then after they crossed over to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, he took only three with him deep into the garden where he prayed. Then early that morning, they all scattered, followed by a final denial by his dear friend, Peter. In our Wednesday morning women's class, I've been, we've been walking through the Gospel of Mark, and I've been encouraging everyone to read it as if they don't know the ending. I don't think we can possibly know the absolute amazing joy of Jesus' resurrection until we try to understand how dark the world was without him. On the second Sunday of Lent, we extinguish one more candle to remember the growing darkness when the crowds turned away from the only true light. In a moment, we'll gather in fellowship around the tables to share these reimagined Passover symbols of Jesus' body and blood. If you have an offering to bring to God, there are baskets to receive it. If you are a guest, you are welcome at our table. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we come to your table, we remember how dark the world is without Jesus and how bright is the dawn of his rising. With overwhelming gratitude, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come to the tables.
runs as deep as it is wide. You know all our hopes. Lord, you know all our fears. And words cannot express the love we feel, but we long for you to hear. So listen to our hearts. Hear our spirits sing. A song of praise and Tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. If words could fall like rain from these lips of mine, and if I had a thousand years, Lord, I would still run out of time. If you listen to my heart, every beat will say, Thank you for the truth. Thank you for the way. So listen to our hearts. Hear our spirits sing. A song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you but words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. So listen to our hearts, hear our spirits sing, a song of praise and flows from those you have redeemed, and we will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. But words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. Have a seat. Good morning, Springs Church. Welcome to each and every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ today. It's wonderful to be with you, wonderful to be back, and to be back in the pulpit after a fantastic missions month. And it's been great over the last couple months to see the room is pretty full in here, and that's been encouraging, mostly just because of all the brand new faces that we see, the new members that have been coming in, and the new visitors. So if you are a visitor this morning, we just want to thank you for being here. We want to thank you for choosing to come worship with us and check things out, and uh, as we always say, we'd love a chance to meet you, to talk with you. We've got visitor cards in the lobby. There's a QR code in your Sunday sheet if you want to access the digital version. And we just love a chance to connect with you this morning. We're in week two of a new sermon series called Gathered by God, the Work of the People. And Ben kicked us off last week in Genesis 12 with the call of Abram, the call to be a blessing to all nations, to worship on behalf of the world. And you might recognize the subtitle in our sermon series, The Work of the People. That's kind of a wooden rendering of the word liturgy. Liturgy is probably a word you've heard tossed around. It really kind of means a, a formal plan for worship. Uh, but if you kind of break the word down and separate it apart, you could say that it means the work of the people. And that's what worship is. That's what following, serving, worshiping God is. That is our work as the people of God. And so this morning, we spend a little more time together learning about the work of the people in the book specifically of Exodus. We're in Exodus 19, 1 through 8. 
On the third new moon, after the Israelites had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, And tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice, keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Let's pray. God, we praise you. We give thanks for your gathering us here this morning. You're calling us here to this place to worship you, to do the work of the people, to learn the postures of life with you for the sake of the world. God, bless us as we seek to know you, as we seek to hear from you. We ask that your Holy Spirit would illuminate your word in our hearing. And I ask you, God, yet again for the gift of preaching. We praise you, Lord, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever. Amen. My mother-in-law ruined cereal for me. I should say and preface that I love my in-laws. I've probably said that many times in case they're watching on the live stream. I love my in-laws. I really do, though. They're fantastic people. That said, my mother-in-law ruined cereal for me, and not the taste or texture or substance of cereal itself, She ruined the experience of eating cereal for me. And it might sound like I'm blaming her, and I am. (laughs) But really, I'm honestly the only one at fault because all she really did was point out to me something that I do while I eat cereal. So apparently, when I eat cereal, I take my scoop of cereal and Apparently, I can't put cereal shoveled into my mouth without clanking the metal spoon on my teeth. I didn't know that was a thing. I I might be ruining cereal for some of you right now as well. I, I didn't know that that was a thing that I did or that other people didn't do. I guess most people can get cereal into their mouth without clanking their teeth. I apparently do that, and I've been doing that for about three decades. I didn't know this, and now I do. And I can never eat cereal the same way again. I mean, you would think that I could just adjust my behavior, but you'd be surprised after a million bites of cereal, it's hard to make a million and one different. So cereal is not the same experience for me anymore. It's been changed by something that was always there that was basically just hidden in plain sight. I just didn't hear it or feel it. So we're in Gathered by God this morning in the book of Exodus, and I've spent a lot of time in Exodus. Church my whole life, classes at school, a sermon series we preached a few years ago, and recently I had pointed out to me something about Exodus that I had never heard or seen or felt before, and that is that In the book of Exodus, at the very heart of this book, is worship. Worship is a primary theme, a primary purpose and motif in the book of Exodus. It's always been there. 
I've never realized that it's basically been hidden in plain sight, but I haven't thought about Exodus as a book for worship. When I think Bible books and worship, I go probably to Psalms right away. But if we look closely at the book of Exodus, we'll find that hidden in plain sight, something we've never noticed that's been as invisible as an unexamined habit, has been the centrality of worshiping God. And so I want to look at that this morning with you in the light of Exodus chapter 19. But before we get there, we got to go back further. Because really, this is a thread that runs all the way throughout the book. And we got to go all the way back to that iconic chapter 3 of the book of Exodus. You probably know the story. Moses born of a Hebrew woman. The Israelites are enslaved in Egypt, but he's raised by Pharaoh's daughter. A series of unfortunate events. Moses leaves Egypt, and it's on Mount Sinai that he encounters a burning bush. And God speaks to him through this burning bush. And in verse 9 of chapter 3, God says, The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt... You shall worship God on this mountain. So Moses displays his infamous fear and hesitancy here. He says, God, who am I to go to Pharaoh to free Israel? Who am I? God says, I'll be with you. And here's how you're going to know. Here's the sign I'm going to give you that it was me who sent you, freeing you. You're going to come right back here with Israel and worship me. And so we find right at the very beginning, this pivotal moment in Exodus, that worshiping God is the proof of freedom. God says, that's how you're going to know, Moses. All of Israel, freed, will come to this mountain together and you will worship me. That's how you know I did it. That's how you know I'm the one who sent you and freed you. Worship. There's a strange feature about this proof, though, this reassurance, this sign, is that it's going to come after the fact. That's not typically the way we like our reassurance. We usually like that on the front end of taking up a task. We don't usually have a project manager talking to a subcontractor who says, you know, the way you can trust me that I'm good for this money, the way you know that I'm good for it is when you're cashing that check at the bank. That's when you know I'm good for this money. I don't know. That's not real reassuring to me. Maybe that happens. I don't know that world very well. But to Moses, this doesn't seem like the most reassuring thing to say, hey, in the future, you're going to be worshiping here. That's the proof. But that is the proof. And yet God gives him something more. Notice in verse 11, Moses says to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God says, I will be with you. Sometimes when we're in sorrow, struggle, doubt, strife, we ask God for certainty and he gives us his company. We ask God for proof, and he gives us his presence. God, who is beyond space, time, matter, who cannot be empirically proven under a microscope, we don't get that certainty, this side of things. But God says, I will be with you. Let that be enough. There's actually an old Switchfoot song, the chorus. says, let me know that you're near me, let me know your touch, let me know that you love me, and let that be enough. 
We ask for certainty. We ask for proof. God gives us his company and his presence. May we let that be enough. But as we move through Exodus, we find that worshiping God is not just the proof of freedom. There's more to it. And so the story continues, and Moses eventually does agree, and he goes to Pharaoh, and he says those famous words that we know, let my people go, that God tells him to say. And Pharaoh says no, and God combats Pharaoh with a plague, and Moses comes back, and the cycle repeats, and the cycle repeats again and again. And we know those four words, let my people go, that God continually tells Moses to say to Pharaoh, But do we remember what comes after that? We know, let my people go, but what comes after those four words? In chapter 7, is the first time we hear it, in verse 16, God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh, say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to say to you, to you to say, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. Worshiping God is the point of freedom. The whole point of being free is so that we may live lives indebted to God. The whole point of being free is so that we may serve and follow and worship the God who has made us free. Remember, this isn't just a freedom for freedom's sake. It's not just a negative freedom without any constraints. As we've said before, this is not just a freedom from something. It's a freedom for something. It's a positive freedom so that we can worship God. We forget that. We remember, let my people go. We don't remember why. And if we do remember why, we might think that it's the promised land. That's why we're freed, so we can get to the promised land. That's why Israel is taken out of bondage. And yes, that's true, but the whole point of the promised land is to have a place to live and be with God and worship him. Worshiping God is the point of the exodus. But Pharaoh says no. Pharaoh continues to say no, and there's this struggle, this struggle between power and worship, between freedom and worship, between political power and worship that we see play out between Moses and Pharaoh. And these two things, political power and worship, are in constant tension throughout history, really, not just in Exodus, but we've seen this in our own context today, haven't we? If you remember your civics class from high school, you might remember that 1990 landmark Supreme Court case, Employment Division versus Smith. If you don't remember, Alfred Smith was a member of the Native American church, and he was, that is a church that uses peyote, which is a drug, an illegal substance, but they use it as kind of a sacrament during worship, And so Alfred Smith worshiped there, used peyote, but he also happened to be a drug rehab counselor. And so he was fired uh, from this rehab counseling position for using the peyote, and he wanted the unemployment benefits, but eventually this case went to the Oregon Supreme Court all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they actually ruled against Smith saying that, no, the state doesn't have to make an exception for religious ceremonies, but they can, but they don't have to. There's that struggle again, that struggle between political power and worship, between freedom and worship, a struggle that we see play out in an entirely different context with Pharaoh and Moses. So Moses keeps coming back to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go, and Pharaoh says, no. And then Moses says, let my people go, and Pharaoh says, yes, but you gotta worship here in Egypt. You can't go out in the wilderness. Moses says, not good enough. Let my people go. Pharaoh says, yes, but you gotta leave the children here. Can't take them. 
Moses says, no, the cycle continues to repeat again and again and again until finally in chapter 10. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, go worship the Lord. Only your flocks and your herds shall remain behind. Even your children may go with you. But Moses said, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings to sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must choose some of them for the worship of the Lord our God, and we will not know what to use to worship the Lord until we arrive there. In worshiping God, everything must go. Nothing can stay. Because we don't know what the Lord will require of us. We are free to worship God, but we are constrained by him, the most liberating constraint, and yet we don't know what he'll require of us. Everything must be held with an empty palm to be put on the altar before him. We don't know what he'll ask of us. We don't know what sacred cows of ours he may have us sacrifice. And that is why we must be free, all of ourselves, to be given to God in service and worship. Because worshiping God is the very point of our freedom. And so Israel is set free. And as the story goes, they walk through the Red Sea, and God defeats Pharaoh and his army, and after several wilderness episodes, they finally get back to Mount Sinai, to that proof Moses was waiting for. They get to come and worship God, and in Exodus 19, we see it says, Then Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, And tell the Israelites, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. This is really kind of a continuation, an expansion, and an intensifying of Moses' original experience with the burning bush. This is kind of an intensifying of chapter 3, right here in chapter 19, because we've got the collective people of Israel now with him. And I want to focus on God calls Israel his his treasured possession, his holy nation, and specifically, he says they're a priestly kingdom, a kingdom of priests. What does a priest do? A priest is in charge of worship. A priest is in charge of sacrifice, of instructing people in the ways of life with God. And priests, specifically, as one commentator has pointed out, have kind of two directions for their vocation, right? Priests are mediators. Priests stand between God and the world, between God and his people. And so priests have this kind of upward vocation. They have this vocation of standing as a representative of the people and worshiping and praying to God on their behalf, of representing the people to God. And yet they also have this kind of downward vocation of standing and mediating the presence and gift and grace and salvation of God to the people. They stand in the middle here. Priests are the way that God communicates to the people and the way that the people communicate to God. And so we see in this vocation for Israel as a priestly kingdom that worshiping God is the plan for freedom. 
It's not just the proof. It's not just the point. Worshiping God is the plan for freedom. The way that God makes the world free to worship him is through the free worship of his people, Israel. They're the ones as priests who stand between the world and God and mediate his presence to the world and worship on behalf of the world towards God, teaching them how to live in a Godward direction. Worshiping God is the plan for the freedom of all of creation. Those famous words of Moses that we know, let my people go. I think partly we know those words so well because they've been enshrined in history through an African American spiritual, go down Moses. Remember when Israel was in Egypt's land? Let my people go. These words have been important to African American people for their entire history in America. They've read the book of Exodus alongside of Israel seeing correlation between their enslavement and their own enslavement. And so these spirituals developed, this Jesus worship developed with a lot of this language from Exodus. Spirituals that were sung in the plantation fields in slavery. But what some have shown and argued is that within these spirituals, these songs of Jesus worship, is not just worship, but within these very songs are hidden messages of freedom. That there are songs that talk about the stars, that talk about directions to freedom through the Underground Railroad that were sung in the fields. You see, they longed for freedom, but leaving or even planning to leave was dangerous. It could cost you your life, so you have to communicate in secrecy. You have to communicate in these hidden codes. And there's even a song called Steal Away to Jesus. Steal away to Jesus. That is Jesus' worship, but embedded within is this hidden message of liberation. This way to notify people when to stay and when to leave for freedom. You see, worshiping God is the plan for freedom because worship shows us the way to freedom. We worship Jesus because embedded within our Jesus worship, embedded within worship of God, is the plan to his salvation and liberation. Embedded within our worship is this priestly vocation that the people of Israel have to show the world the way to freedom in God. And because of Jesus Christ, grafted into Israel. Because of Jesus Christ, we get to be adopted as sons and daughters. We get to become part of that kingdom of priests, and we get to show the world the way to worship God to freedom. We get to show the world that worshiping God is the proof. It's the whole point, and it is the plan for being free. Because it's in worshiping God that we learn what it means to be a truly free human being. Because the only human being who has ever been perfectly obedient, perfectly free, has been the high priest, Jesus Christ. Who shows us with his worship of the Father through the love of the Holy Spirit how to be free for the kingdom of God. May we proclaim to the world the way to freedom, the way to God through our worship of Jesus Christ. Let's stand and praise him together, church.
company and the presence of God be with you this week as you go. And may you go this week freely worshiping God on behalf of the world. Go in peace, church.